All right, thanks for coming. I want to welcome you all to our talk on connecting players across platforms and uh, store ecosystems with Epic Online Services. My name is Josh Markowitz. I'm the engineering director for the Epic Services, Online Services SDK team. Uh, we make the SDK and uh, work with our backend teams to provide the APIs to everyone uh, that would use our services. This is Rajan. Hey everyone, I'm Rajan. I uh, work uh, in helping studios and publishers be successful using Epic Online Services and going to the Epic Games store. And with us we have Sam. Hey, I'm uh, Sam Malone. I'm the game director at Vaulted Sky Games. Our game is Midnight Ghost Hunt and it uses Epic Online Services. There you go. So yeah, a little background on Midnight Ghost Hunt. Um, yeah, it's a ghostly multiplayer hide and seek game. You can play as either ghosts or ghost hunters in like a 4v4 format. It's an evolution of the prop hunt formula, but with more of a strong ghost hunting theme and like more action team-based gameplay. It's a bit more of a shooter and you know you can choose your loadouts. There's different gadgets and there's different abilities you can choose from, all that kind of stuff. Uh, started actually as a solo project by myself, uh, but then I partnered up uh, with Coffee Stain Publishing and uh, scaled up to about 14 people before entering early access in March 2022. And I guess to start us off from my perspective, uh, multiplayer game development is hard, especially with a small, inexperienced indie team. But by leveraging EOS's free features, uh, we were able to ship with all the expected multiplayer features that you would want in a game like this. So it was great using them. Then uh, here I've got a quick little portion of our release trailer just so you get a sense of how the game plays and what it looks like. And it has some cool music. Right, that's tough to follow, but I will try by giving you an overview of Epic Online Services uh, and diving a little bit more into what components make up Crossplay and how we got there. Um, and then we'll hand it off to Josh for some more in-depth detail in there. So Epic Online Services, for those of you who don't know or aren't familiar, it is a set of free services that we offer from Epic and their backend game services. We have them roughly bucketized in a couple different categories. One is what we call game services, which are universal services that you can use on any storefront, any platform, um, and with any identity provider. So there's no restrictions or requirements on how you can be using these things. So they offer functionality across you know, multiplayer, moderation, operations, progression. Uh, we'll dig into the specifics in a, bit, in a little bit. But once, if you do not have your own identity provider or social ecosystem uh, set up already, you can use Epic Account Services, which is part of Epic Online Services, but it gives you access to players that use Epic Games accounts. All of the 500 plus million players that we have using it today, all of their friend connections, you can leverage that and integrate that into your game. So it's a great way to kind of kickstart your social ecosystem in your game as well. Um, like I said, it gives you access to friends. It comes with an overlay as well. So within the overlay, you can send out game invites and, and join others, uh, the typical functionality there. A um, couple other things that I want to quickly mention, but we're not going to go into detail here. Uh, if you interact with the Epic Games Store, there are services that you access through the Epic, game, uh, Epic Online Services SDK. So for example, if you interact with e-commerce on the Epic Games Store, you would use the same SDK as well. Um, and as part of Epic Online Services, we have an offering from our uh, friends at Super Awesome, which is called Kids Web Services. So if your game does anything with you know, parental verification or things like that, you could leverage that free functionality to tap into that ecosystem and the functionality that they offer to facilitate that process. Because obviously, you do not want to build that out yourself. Um, and we already have an established process for that. So digging into Epic Online Services specifically, uh, the two buckets that I just mentioned, here you see kind of an overview of the different services that we offer within each. Uh, I'm not going to go through one by one, but 
Um, this is a good way to kind of show you the breadth of functionality that can be covered if you use Epic Online Services. Um, but also note that any of these things are uh, kind of pick as you go or, or whatever you want to choose for your game what makes sense, right? So you can leverage the services that, that you need without being dependent on any of the other things. Like I said, all the stuff in blue on the left side is not dependent on the stuff on the right side. So if you have your own identity system, you could use all the things on the left as well. Uh, but you do get that additional functionality on the right as well. So um, Sam is going to kind of highlight a little bit on how they made their right ideal pick uh, of, of combination of services uh, throughout the rest of this session as well. So whenever we talk about Epic Online Services, the immediate question, especially if we mention that it's free, right? The immediate question is, why is Epic doing this? Why are you doing this for free? Is there a catch? What am I missing? Um, and the main thing to note is that there, there really is no catch. And the reason why we offer these things is because we already built out these services mostly when we built out Fortnite, right? So it's powering all those experiences. Uh, we're running those things at scale, obviously, for Fortnite, but now the Epic Game Store itself also uses some of these services in the back end. So we are already running these things, and we want to offer those online features uh, to be accessible for everyone, right? We know that this is a lot of work that you need to do to facilitate a multiplayer game, and we want to make sure that we offer that so connecting players and growing communities doesn't become this huge burden on you as a game developer. And ultimately, it just boils down to we want to help you to focus on what your game brings to the table in unique experiences without having to worry about all the plumbing underneath to kind of make that functional from a multiplayer perspective. So just to quickly highlight, and there's a lot obviously in terms of how you actually do that. We're not gonna go super in depth in terms of the overall process, but just a quick note of um, the, the components that you would need. One, we have a developer portal, which is an environment where you go in, you configure the services that you need, you, you have access control, all the things that you would expect in that environment, you can control who can set up things there, etc. cetera. Um, and then when you get that all set up, you use the SDK, obviously, to integrate into your game. And we have an SDK that's available for multiple platforms. So on PC, we support C and C Sharp. Uh, console platforms, we also support that, but we also have mobile SDKs uh, for Android and iOS available. Um, on top of the SDKs that you could use with any engine on any platform, uh, there are plugins that we have either created or see in the market. We ourselves create a plugin for Unreal Engine using the online subsystem that's available there. Um, we partner with a company called Play Everywhere. They built out the same plugin or similar functionality plugin for Unity. So that exists in the market as well. Uh, but Sam can chime in a little bit about their approach to the plugin space. Yeah, so for us in particular, we wanted to be able to rapidly prototype uh, using Epic Online Services and Blueprint uh, in Unreal Engine. So we went to the Unreal Marketplace and got a plugin called EOS Core, shout out to them, and allowed us to do pretty much all of our uh, Epic Online Services functionality with our lobbies and sessions uh, through Blueprint, which made it super easy for quick, um, you know, rapid prototyping and stuff like that. So it was really a great resource to have. Yeah, so it's, it's very exciting for us to see that, right? So in the community, we see adoption, not just from a developer perspective, but there's also community growing, and they see the added value that they can have, and they leverage the Unreal Engine marketplace for that. So there's definitely options out there. If uh, certain functionality you require, make sure you check out the marketplace for that. So this is a quick, and again, uh, not to go through all the detail here, but just to inform you guys that we you have a public roadmap that's available. There's a QR code on the screen if you want to scan that and, and go to that URL that's listed on, this, on the slide. But on this public roadmap, we do highlight the things that we're working on currently, the things that are upcoming next. So it's a good way for you to keep posted on the things that are coming imminently so you are aware of the expansion of Epic Online Services and if some features are missing or um, things that you that you see on the roadmap are coming, you can take that into account for your own planning. Um, as you can see here, there's a couple different categories of things, right, that we see here. So some of these services we consider a little bit more complete and feature functionally complete uh, than others. Some of them were currently working on expansion based on feedback that we've already gotten, um, and some of them are in development. So similar to the other slide that uh, was there a couple slides ago. Um, features are constantly being added, so the service keeps expanding. 
So that was a quick overview of EOS itself, but like we're talking about crossplay here specifically, right? And how you enable that within your game. So crossplay itself, um, any of these terms that are on the slide on the left, you've probably seen or heard before. You know, players talk about cross-platform, cross-progression, cross-save, um, but ultimately what it boils down to is that all of these things combined really um, reflect the fact that players expect to play your game on their platform of choice, on their device of choice, but they do not want to be limited to a friends list that they would have on that specific platform, right? So they want to be able to play with their friends wherever they choose to play, send invites across, et cetera. So we, we recognize that this is a hard problem to solve, right? Because when you have all these different ecosystems and all these individual platforms with their own API surface and their own social ecosystems, it becomes very hard once you start to figure out how many connections you have to make to really make that work across, right? So if one player buys your game on Xbox, they have access to that ecosystem, but if one of their friends buys it on PlayStation, then you have to figure out how to make that connection and then multiply it by however many platforms you have to support. So at Epic, when, we've, when we started building out our cross-play um, capabilities, we really set out to achieve four goals. And one, the, one of the important things that I just mentioned, um, we want to offer a centralized cross-store friends, friends list. So if players can find their friends, they can interact with them, it doesn't matter what platform they're on, it's all in the same kind of environment to become friends and to interact with their friends. The second one, which is an important piece, is we want to make sure that it's not a huge effort or hassle to get started, right? Ideally, in a situation, I tell Josh, like, hey, I want to play this game. I don't want him to hop onto his platform and then have to go through an entire account creation process and verification process. So we want to make that as easy as possible. So we have a, a type of account that we call proxy accounts. Josh is going to explain a little bit more in detail. But that allows players to really onboard very quickly and get into the game fast, because that's ultimately the goal that they want to achieve rather than go through an entire sign-up process. Um, the third thing that's really important is we want to make sure it's a secure social experience where bad actors or even mistakes can't really affect the player negatively in a destructive way. So for example, if you're playing a game, you don't necessarily want the game to be able to completely wipe your friends list or add 100 friends to your friends list without you being in control. So one of the important things is that we want to make sure players have agency to confirm those things that that is actually the intent of the player. Um, and not some other mechanism that they weren't expecting to happen. Um, and then the last piece, obviously, it's, it's almost, you don't have to say that, but it is important that it's plug and play, that it's easy to integrate. We don't want to make a solution that becomes then another burden for you to deal with to integrate into your game. So it needs to be fairly lightweight and, and fast to integrate. So to talk a little bit about how their journey going from Steam to uh, you know, getting ready for cross storefront, I'll hand it off to Sam again. Yeah, so um, yeah, early in development for Midnight Ghost Hunt, we were just using the Steamworks SDK. We were doing our alpha testing weekends on Steam. So uh, we were just using that. It had authentication and it had sessions, all that stuff. But we knew in the future we wanted to have you know, multiple platforms, cross-play opportunities. For a multiplayer game, of course, you want to have the widest uh, pool of players that you can draw from. So uh, during one of our later beta tests, we switched over from Steamworks to uh, EOS and using the Connect interface, we actually, when we made the switch, players didn't even really know that we did because we still had the same profile pictures uh, and the same uh, profile names. All that stuff was basically the same, but by doing so, we had front-loaded the effort uh, in the future for having cross-play, which is something we really definitely wanted for a multiplayer game, obviously. And uh, yeah, in the future, we're going to be trying to take away some of those like hard-coded for Steam things that we have uh, in, the, in the past, because we just assume that. That's our current platform. But in the future, we want to leverage all of the features of uh, EOS to be able to have more platform generic code and be able to just ship it on as many platforms as it makes sense without having to worry, so. Cool. So just a quick slide on kind of where we are and where we're headed. Um, so last year in June, we released uh, a bunch of functionality, what I just talked through in terms of reaching those goals for PC. So in June, we had an SDK, it's SDK 1.15, um, and that really enables all this functionality on PC, right? So it brings all the cross-play uh, um, functionality there. It has the overlay where you can integrate it on Steam, for example, and have your Steam and Epic friends show up in the same interface. So it's really streamlining that player experience. 
Um, this year, we're working on expanding that functionality to consoles. So same experience, but offering it to developers to integrate on console platforms, the same overlay functionality, the same Epic Games account integration. And then beyond, we're going to take that to mobile platforms as well uh, to kind of round out our platform offering as well as just general improvements across the board that we want to make for that. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of all these things. Let me hand it off to Josh to talk a little bit more detail of each of the individual components. Thank you, Rajan. So as we've mentioned uh, before, we have a lot of different services and you know, while this might be a small part of a user's journey, we wanna make sure that this is well understood, it's kind of complex, uh, it's one of the biggest topics that we have, which is authentication. So we'll start with the left-hand side with game services. As Rajan mentioned, this stuff is universal, it's not really tied down to any particular authentication uh, provider. But what we like to do is we like to kind of keep a key, key ring or key chain analogy. Uh, where you see in the middle there, there's something called the product user ID. It's not really an account. There's no email address or anything associated with it. It's a simple identifier that Epic uses to kind of keep track and provide access to lobbies, voice, achievements, leaderboards, and all the services that Rajan had mentioned before. Um, so what you want to do is you have your options. Uh, we can you know, completely ignore Epic's account services if you'd like, and you can connect directly with Steam, Xbox Live, PlayStation, and a host of other providers, um, even OpenID, if you have your own uh, service, so which will get you right into the services on the right. Um, we kind of would like you to use the Epic Games account stuff, because there's some more new features we'll show on the, on the future slides. But um, regardless of your choice, you, know, you log into a, a, an Epic account on this, or you log into a PUID on this side, you have access to those features. Um, our goals are twofold. You know, we want to make sure anyone can use these without our stuff, as well as uh, just want to be able to use the individual features without extra dependencies. Um, so anyway, we have uh, just kind of a simple uh, login flow uh, that we use here on the Connect side just to kind of show the difference between this and the future slide. Um, if you are kind of doing this yourself, you'll see you log in, um, and typically the user's first experience is they will fail to log in, that we won't know who this user is. Um, and that big diamond in the middle, we want to make sure that we make it clear, have you ever played this game before anywhere else? One of the big things we definitely run into is account merge issues and you know, if the person's played on Xbox and they're moving over to PlayStation or if they're on Switch, they don't want to have two accounts. You don't want to have to merge their progression or deal with um, those kind of issues. So in this case, if you're choosing to use Connect directly, um, we want to make sure they can log in with the secondary provider that you specify, but you do have to handle that. Once they've logged in, we have functionality to link the accounts and they can uh, connect. So, or if they've never played before, they just create the, this product user account for them, product user ID for them, and uh, you're done. And you can find all this on the Connect Interface documentation uh, webpage. So the other half is Epic Account Services. Um, it's also, it's called our Auth Interface. It's also documented um, via that QR code at the bottom there if you'd like to go see. Um, if you do want to access our user identity or our social graph or our user presence and user info, you're going to want to implement this side of, uh, of the SDK. Like the one before, we also keep the same key ring analogy. This is a separate keychain, um, but this time you do attach to the Epic Account. Same uh, auth providers are, are uh, supported here on this side as on the past uh, in, within the addition of email uh, and password. So uh, if you do choose to use this, it gets access to the social graph and uh, all the other services uh, that we mentioned before. So I'm going to let uh, Sam talk a little bit about how they've implemented it in Monster Ghost Hunt. <laughs> Midnight Ghost Hunt. Sorry. Yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Close enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically for uh, Midnight Ghost Hunt, we have a little video here that shows. I'm going to play it. Uh, it's a really short little video, but essentially what we, we're using the Connect interface currently, so what it does is it just takes your Steam app ticket uh, and runs it through Connect and then logs you into uh, Epic Online Services. You can pretty much display it however you want. You could do it, we just have a little widget that says connecting to services, which is nice and simple. You don't really need to mention EOS if you don't want to. You can let it happen in the background without you even knowing. It's all super uh, flexible, which is nice for us. So uh, talking a little bit about you know, auth considerations on console, if you do want to kind of continue development uh, this way, uh, it basically you have some certification requirements that come to mind uh, from both, uh, for all the, the platform providers. So what we do here is if you do want to use our services, when you call login, you'll be presented with a series of screens. Uh, we try to make sure it's clear to the user that they have a chance to sign in immediately at this time. If they don't have a concept or if they've never played your games before, 
they can do uh, create account. This is what Rajan was mentioning before with proxy accounts. So we wanna capture the user at this time to make sure that we have a place to store new friendships and progress and progression, and all the things that cross uh, play and progression provide. And so even though they're not really creating an account, we still kind of have something called a proxy account. It's associated with the external auth uh, information that they do at this time. So they'll go through, they'll create an account on the second screen there, and then finally on the right, we try to be super transparent. We wanna make sure that it's like we have their consent that we'll be sharing this information with the third party uh, provider. Um, and of course, it's some things to keep in mind. It's super important to make sure that it's clear who's logging in, um, both not, you know, during login, but once they also get to the main menu, right? We wanna make sure that there's accounts that are being linked together, parents, families, they may have multiple accounts, you may have automated logins such that things just happen without you knowing it, and we don't want people to be accidentally linking the wrong accounts to the wrong thing. So we try to make this really clear, you can see in the bottom right uh, slide there, or bottom right uh, sl screen, that it mentions what platform uh, we notice and what we'll be linking, and of course we wanna make sure that you can unlink these accounts at any time as well. So, um, we also wanna make sure that this is an example of you know, kind of continuing that uh, as players play, you know, the platforms have the requirements that we know who they are. You can see here in the, the bottom left, you know, this is who you are and what you're doing on the platform just to kind of confirm that you've logged in correctly. Um, and then our social overlay, we wanna make sure that you know, if you're on the native platform with these other players and your friends list that you can tell and it seems familiar to you from like the PlayStation user here in this example. But if they're not on the same platform, it's also important to recognize that these players are off the network or off the native uh, platform that you're working on. So um, under the hood, when integrating with the SDK, you're gonna also wanna make sure to keep the Epic accounts and the uh, native login accounts in sync. Uh, if you're, for example, if you're in the middle of a login flow and the user uh, logs out locally or you, know, you have a controller issue where it runs out of batteries, you're gonna wanna kind of make sure it's clear that you stop that process and uh, reset um, also, you wanna be able to think about your game design. You don't have to log in at startup. Maybe you have a single player experience or some other thing where you kinda of wanna let it know the user it's optional. So they can, you know, maybe before they go into the multiplayer area, they can log in and, and if they never play over there, they don't have to be associated with an Epic account or your account system. Um, you wanna just kinda of sandbox those areas and keep them separate. Uh, finally, you wanna kinda of think about what kind of data you're exposing. This is more, you know, for the devs. Um, you know, it's not necessary. There's a lot of account IDs, a lot of user information that's kind of flying around as you work in this cross-platform world. You wanna limit access to these values. The SDK doesn't expose these things uh, to developers, and we also wanna make sure you limit your exposure uh, across platforms. You know, it shouldn't be necessary to replicate these IDs um, in your multiplayer situation, like sending an Xbox ID to a PlayStation really serves no purpose, so just something to, to keep in mind. Um, so here's Sam again, I just want to talk about uh, the first user uh, in providing a great player experience for him. Right, uh, so in the future when we're gonna have uh, cross-play for Midnight Ghost Hunt, we sort of have this roughed out uh, sort of flow that we would like to do. We're interested in, the first time you log in after we make this switch to having cross-play, you would get a uh, Epic account prompt essentially, it'd be like, hey, do you wanna link your Epic account? If you do this, you get your cross-platform friends, your cross-platform game invites, that kind of stuff, but also sort of emphasize that you don't need uh, to link it to essentially get cross-play, to be able to play with uh, people just like in the pool with all the other platforms. And there's the option to skip it, and you can always do it later in the uh, options menu later. If the uh, account link already exists, actually, we would properly display, oh, we already recognize that your account is linked with Epic. Do you want to just use that so it's a bit easier, which would be nice. And then I think we'll also have the option so that if you go into the option menu, you could still opt out of crossplay entirely if you would like, but I think maybe there's some console versus PC considerations. But uh, I think in general, it's better to have the, the widest pool of players to draw from at any given time. Okay, so now that the user's logged in and they're in the main menu and hopefully it's pretty clear what they've done and, and how they've linked their accounts, we wanna talk a little bit about uh, social interaction. Uh, we, have, we offer an overlay uh, with our SDK that combines um, both the epic friendships and the social graph that's been mentioned along with the native friendships uh, into a single, expressible, a single accessible screen 
uh, that the user can use uh, right here. Uh, it does require the Epic account login uh, side of things, um, but provides numerous features through the X that you, UX that you don't have to implement yourself. Um, it offers friends management, user presence information, player profiles, and reporting. Uh, we'll talk about reporting uh, toward the end of uh, the slides. Um, basically, you'll be able to send uh, game invites to other users, join games via presence, um, and it's a compliant turnkey solution uh, for these complex problems and puts cross-platform uh, within reach of all the, the developers here. Um, of course, it's important, again, another cert requirement for consoles is to make sure that you know, outside the game, you know, when you're sitting on the dashboard uh, on the Xbox or the PlayStation, that these users are also reachable, and we're gonna talk about that in uh, just a second here. Um, finally, the overlay and some of the other things that gonna go on internally to the SDK. We handle string sanitization, so display names and other user-generated content. Um, we run through the APIs that are native to those platforms to make sure that we're uh, complying with their uh, desires. Uh, we also respect the block list, so if you have existing block lists on a platform, we keep that in mind and handle that for you uh, so that players cannot be uh, you know, reaching you through Epic services uh, or other means. Uh, we also enforce parental permissions. So again, we leverage the native APIs, make sure that you know, if a player's not allowed to play online or not allowed to voice chat, uh, that we respect the, the native platform's uh, uh, conditions. And of course then, you know, there's muting, uh, you can also do that as well. So uh, we mentioned display names, and with all the different platforms and all the different um, you know, names that are kind of floating around, we've tried you know, very hard during Fortnite to kind of figure out a plan on how to make sense, which complies with all the cert requirements, and just provides some sanity to, uh, to the situation. So this flowchart, you know, it's important to notice over in the, the left there that this really doesn't matter who's looking at the information, it just depends mostly on where the person is. Um, and for the most part, if they're online and they're on a console, that's the name you choose. Um, if they happen to be playing with you and they're not on a console, well, we choose the Epic uh, display name. Um, and if they happen to be offline but they're a friend of yours, based on you know, whether or not they're a proxy account, we try to show the Epic display name, otherwise we use the only name that we have, which will be the, the platform's uh, display name uh, to kind of you know, make sure it was clear that you know, who this person is and that the name didn't change uh, to a different ecosystem based on uh, you know, some platform you don't play with them. And then finally, there's some edge case stuff, like if you're showing names in leaderboards or if there's other kind of UGC type content. Um, you know, but this, this full charge has kind of kept us sane as we were developing our products. Finally, uh, so you know, now we've talked about social, we've talked about logging in, want to be able to communicate with our friends, so let's talk about voice chat. Um, we offer it in two forms. One, that you can integrate on your own terms or you can kind of just turn it on through our lobby system and you get um, access to this integration for, uh, for free. Um, but regardless of the method, we provide APIs for input and output selection, and as Sam's gonna talk about in a little while, um, we all provide raw access to the data streams through callback, so you can post-process and work with the data uh, in its more raw form. So the simpler uh, example here is through voice chat with lobbies. Uh, you can see here on the diagram, the game client integrates the SDK, and under the hood, as an SDK creates a lobby, it interacts with the voice services in the back end, gets all the auth tokens and permissions, uh, handles uh, player management so that you know, the, if a lobby gets full, it keeps people out. Uh, things that you will have to provide, we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Um, but for the most part, you know, you, you, it just works, right? If you use our lobby service, you get voice chat for free, and, uh, and you just don't have to do a whole lot of uh, minutia there. Uh, however, you know, there's a lot more complicated uh, situations where maybe you want to handle things. If you're talking to a dedicated server or you have a more complicated team or player need to kind of separate how players join with others. Um, here again, the game client integrates the SDK, but you'll provide the, the middle part through a game server or some sort of trusted web backend, uh, and you'll be the ones making the calls to the voice API through um, to get those auth tokens and then provide those back to the client so that they can uh, correctly join a voice uh, chat room uh, and go on from there. So here's Sam again, talk a little bit about his integration with voice chat. Sweet. Okay, so yeah, Midnight Ghost Hunt, it's definitely a team-based multiplayer experience. It, it, it's a versus game, kind of competitive. So and we got the two teams, right? The hunters and the ghosts. So we definitely want to have uh, the scalable and powerful ghost uh, <laughs> voice chat service, essentially, that would allow us to 
have all the channels that we need and all the features that we would want for that. And during development, we had experimented with uh, many different voice uh, services, but none of them worked out for various reasons. But yeah, when Epic Online Services announced there would be voice chat included, that was super exciting for us. And it actually, it was extremely easy to implement on our side because as was previously mentioned, we were already using the lobby system and we just literally checked a box uh, on our node and then that lobby now had voice associated with it and it was high quality, great voice chat and it was that was a huge thing for us kind of a game changer and with no additional cost which was amazing and and particularly with our sessions we needed to have at least uh, three voice lobbies actually one for the hunters one for the ghosts and then one um, using the raw data output for a positional voice that both of the teams can communicate with we actually have this kind of fun mechanic where the ghosts can uh, throw their voice and make it seem like their voice is coming from somewhere else in the map. It's, you can, uh, you know, we run it through some fun filters and like makes it sound kind of scary and stuff. And it's actually kind of fun for misleading the hunters and stuff like that. And we, we are able to do that because we can take the raw data streams from EOS, pipe it through Unreal and use an Unreal Sound class and it has uh, attenuation, it has spatialization, has all that stuff so you can have, um, do all that stuff. It's really cool. and. Yeah, I guess the last point I'll make on that is that it's a great choice for indie multiplayer. If you want to have uh, quality voice chat in your game and you're already using EOS, or even if you're not using EOS, the voice chat is a great choice. And I have a quick little demo here that shows, it's kind of silly, but it shows how the ghosts can throw their voice and the hunter's clearly very confused. Uh, so we got the ghost is now in a prop. Hey, hey you, bet you can't catch me. Yeah, I'm over here, I'm over here. You almost got me. Over here. It's kind of hard to tell with the speakers, but basically it's all spatialized audio and the hunter was clearly confused if they had headphones on. Oh, the ghost is over here talking to me. And uh, that is actually recorded from EOS, so it's good sound quality, but piped through and it has a bit more atmosphere and post-processing happening, which is pretty cool and was a big game changer for us. We definitely wanted to do that. And uh, Epic let us do it with online services. Thanks. Okay, so we've talked about voice chat and social. Let's talk a little bit about getting players together more generally through multiplayer. Um, so we have several options uh, through the API. Uh, we have sessions and lobbies, and I'm just gonna kind of talk about the similarities and differences. Uh, let's start with the similarities. For the most part, you know, sessions and lobbies are both meant to be matchmaking type services. So we have finding and searching. You can join up random players and get them together. Um, of course, in order to find those kind of things, we wanna be able to allow you to attribute data with uh, the both sessions and lobbies that you can search for, like you know, pistols only is true, time of day is night, things of that nature. And of course, they both offer game invites and join via presence when, when they're being used. Um, sessions are more you know, basic, uh, server-based, uh, master server situation. We report that you exist, and then you can query that data, find an IP address, and you can join it, which is typical for dedicated servers. Um, with lobbies, you get more of a persistent connection, but it's for clients only. Um, but what's really nice about this is that you, again, you, you, we'll talk about peer-to-peer -peer in a second, but you can, you don't have to worry about hosting, right? You just basically connect to Epic servers, you have a persistent connection, you can share all that data, you can share additionally member data between players, um, you get notifications through callbacks about data updates, things changing, uh, and as we've mentioned already, you have voice. So I think lobbies are pretty powerful to kind of way to connect your players before the game or even during the game. It's um, not meant for like high frequency data, we still kind of expect you to do networking on your own, or we can move on you know, to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. Um, we offer peer-to-peer -peer once they're in the game. Uh, they can use their own network code or this stuff, the, this peer-to-peer uh, -peer API. Uh, one of the big benefits is it will handle connection negotiation. It'll figure out what the best route between players is to join uh, the game getting through NAT or other kind of router firewall uh, type issues so anyone can host a game and you don't have to worry about those things. Um, of course, at worst, you might have to use a relay server, which we provide. It does add a little bit of latency, but at least the players can play together. Uh, so here's uh, Sam again, talk about sessions and lobbies in the game. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so with Midnight Ghost Hunt, we actually heavily utilize sessions and lobbies, both of them at the same time. So when like a player wants to host a session and play a particular map, they host it and that's actually a lobby at first. It's like the pre-game lobby. And it allows players to join either from the quick play or the server browser, but they're still in the main menu and they're able to still, while they're waiting for players, mess around with their loadout or their cosmetics, whatever it is. 
And uh, we actually end up reusing this lobby later for that positional voice that I mentioned because everyone's already in it anyways. So that worked out nicely. Once enough players have joined this lobby, then the, either the peer-to-peer -peer host or the dedicated server will uh, host a session. And that's like where the game is actually played. So once the session is ready, it goes up to the members of the lobby, the pre-game lobby, and they connect. And then now they're playing the game, they're picking their loadout, they're doing that kind of thing. And then uh, once everyone's in, we create actually two more lobbies. We have the hunter team voice lobby that only the hunters join, and then the ghost team lobby that only the ghosts can join. And we even have some like mechanisms so that if there's some sort of auto balancing happening or people change teams for whatever reason, it swaps their lobbies so that uh, the ghosts can only hear the ghosts and vice versa because they might be making some important plans about how they're gonna find all the ghosts or hide from the hunters, whatever it may be. And uh, we also have player parties so people can group up in the main menu and join games together. And we uh, have a system that puts them in the same team no matter what, which is super helpful. And those are also just lobbies. So yeah, it's lobbies all the way down with Midnight Ghost Hunt and it works great. Uh, here's a quick little demo that shows everything that I just described. I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna walk you through it. Here's me inviting my friend to join me in a party. And now, there we are, together. You can create a match real quick, pick your map. We've got a lot of, got a lot of fun maps. And you host it. Now you're in the pregame lobby, we're on the same team, orange means hunter. Now we're in the session, you can pick your loadout, and we're you know taking the van to go up to the haunted house. In this case, it's a haunted school. And then since we were in a party, we're already on the same team. We're both hunters, so we can communicate via the hunter voice channel. The ghosts can't hear us. So peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, being a smaller indie title at first, we uh, didn't really want to have dedicated servers only. We wanted like a zero cost initial solution, which in this case is peer-to-peer -peer listen servers. And uh, actually in the future, we're in the near future, we're gonna have dedicated servers as well, which will be really nice. But at first, yeah, peer-to-peer, -peer, super great, don't have any cost associated with it. And yeah, implementing it super straightforward, it was great. It, uh, using the previously mentioned official online subsystem for uh, Epic Online Services in Unreal Engine, the plugin, super straightforward once we had that going and we just used the regular online subsystem functions that you would have in Unreal Engine. So that was super easy and great. And in, fun, in practice, the peer-to-peer -peer relays and the NAT punch through, they make it simple because in practice, our players don't really need to worry about port forwarding when they're hosting. They don't need to worry about like region locking. Generally, they can just host a match and somebody, their friends can play with them pretty much wherever they are, which is super great. Okay. So just kind of bringing it back to consoles, if, if uh, Sam's team was to integrate with uh, consoles, you know, basically players, again, expect to be able to use the native features to invite and join their friends. So imagine you're sitting in the, the, the dashboard or the, the, the sorry, the main bar of, of like a PlayStation or an Xbox, you know, the game needs to be able to keep the native and platform agnostic services in sync. So using this uh, as an example, this is kind of the seed situation where lobby creation, uh, the user's gonna create an epic lobby and on success, they're going to then create a, you know, the native platform, use the native platform APIs to create the equivalent of a lobby there. Uh, and the point then is to, at the bottom, is to set this lobby ID um, onto the native data so that when you use join via presence or you accept a game invite, you're going to um, be able to leverage that data as we see on this next slide. So this flow here works when you're accepting an invite using the native flows, which like I said, for cert requirements or if you're outside of the game at the moment, what you're gonna do is you're gonna join the native lobby and on success there, you're gonna see that that lobby ID has been placed in that information. You're going to use that to um, search and find and join the epic version of the lobby, and on success, you know, you're now into both lobbies. Um, of course, there's any time there's failures, that, as we're gonna see on the next slide, there may be a reason why that lobby ID isn't there at the moment. So we try to be super resilient. The goal isn't to just fail out on any error, but to try to, uh, over time, recover and um, make these two systems uh, stay in sync. So this is the case for, um, joining when you're already in a game. You actually may, or if you're a cross-platform. If you receive an Epic invite first, you're gonna join the Epic data. And then when you join, you're gonna kinda take a look and see if I'm on a native platform and the native ID doesn't already exist, maybe I'm the first person on Xbox to join the platform. So it's my responsibility to be the platform leader. So I'll be the one to create the native lobby and on success, take that lobby ID and leave it there for the next Xbox person to, to make it, take advantage of. Um, of course, while I'm doing that, someone else may be joining, so they have to wait for the other player up in the upper right there, wait for the other player to kind of create uh, that information. So there's some negotiation there, and again, 
that first person may crash or fall, uh, fall out of the game due to a network uh, failure. So you kind of have to keep checking to see if maybe you became the responsible party for creating that uh, information. So it's, it's not super complicated flow. There's, when I say these retry loops, everything's trying to retry if, if things fail. You kind of wait and delay if, if the data's not there. But ultimately, you'll reach a stable state where you've now, you've now kept uh, two systems in sync and it, it works across all platforms. So I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit more about some of these multiplayer uh, considerations. Um, as we've already discussed play name, display names, it's important that people know who they're playing with and it should be clear to users that they're playing with players on other platforms. Um, some things don't have uh, easy solutions. Like once you've introduced crossplay, well, how do you address game difficulty, right? With Fortnite, for example, we had originally tried uh, controllers versus keyboards. Like, there's obviously some bias there. Is can you keep players with different skills um, from feeling frustrated playing on other against players on other platforms? So, how do you bucket these players? Like, also, you might have skill rating um, across platforms. So, you know, do you have a good, accurate model for what skill might mean uh, to match uh, with your players? Uh, so, Sam's going to mention some of the ideas he had for his game. Right, uh, so we worked with the third party to develop a matchmaking queue and integrated it with Epic Online Services with the product user IDs and the lobby IDs just so that when we put players into a queue, they would end up together in the same uh, Epic Online Services lobby and all that. Uh, we found that in our case, it was best to put the new players kind of in their own matchmaking pool. They would try to play against other new players and then we had this sort of wider pool for the more experienced players. After a set amount of time, we end up just merging the pools so they all kind of go into the same games. But we try to match the newer players together, and that's what worked pretty decent for us. Yeah, and one of the things was that they had a, they actually integrated a different matchmaking queue. So they, they kind of leveraged the, just the player IDs and the lobby IDs to connect directly, and they were able to integrate a different matchmaking logic um, outside of our uh, SDK, yep. uh, what it provided. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, also you're affecting your matchmaking pool sizes, right? So. When players opt out of the experience, now you have to provide an a Xbox only or a PlayStation only uh, place for players to play, or you add a new playlist. Every time you do something like this, it, it further subdivides uh, your matchmaking pool and can increase uh, your matchmaking times. So how do you mitigate this, right? Maybe you uh, have join in progress so players can eventually fill in, and, or maybe you have bots in the game such that you know, it's appropriate for your use case uh, for players to enjoy while other people, real humans, uh, uh, fill in. Um, but one other thing is to actually possibly dynamically alter your matchmaking pools. So here's a flow we did in Fortnite Save the World where as users came and went from the server, we kind of take a look on the left hair side. Um, if someone's joining for the first time and they have cross-play opt-out, um, if everyone on this, in this server at this moment is on the same platform, well, we let them in. And then we update the matchmaking pool to uh, market that it's an Xbox-only session. Now, the player that may have hosted this game, he may not have opted out and he may not know that this player joining is gonna kind of hinder his experience by not letting PlayStation players there. But I mean, the point is that it's full. It's a full game and in a healthy matchmaking situation, players will be constantly coming and going. So you, know, the, you can kind of take this greedy approach um, and it allows these uh, opt-out players a chance to have an experience in a much larger matchmaking pool. Um, once they, uh, so let's say a, a PlayStation user joins um, or tries to join while this happens, they, while, they not, while they are not affected by the opt-out itself, they are not allowed to join, so they'll go back to matchmaking and they'll search for something else, and maybe they'll create a new session or maybe they will find another game with mixed, uh, mixed uh, platforms, but it should be minimal matchmaking time. And then on the right, you know, finally, once a player leaves, if that player was causing opt-out to be effect, in effect while they're there, um, we would open the matchmaking pool again and you know, players in a join in progress type game would be none the wiser. Um, but of course, if, if that player wasn't opt out, then the re platform re remains locked. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, is there, let's see here. Um, yeah, sorry, that's it there. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about moderation with uh, Rajan here. So with all that set up, you have players playing your game, they can find each other, they can get into a match, but uh, as we probably all know, an important part for multiplayer games specifically is uh, moderation, right? What happens if players misbehave? What happens if players are um, not acting the way you want them to in the game? So as part of Epic Online Services, we have uh, three main moderation services. One you're probably already familiar with, which is Easy Anti-Cheat. It's a very well-known and uh, I would say respected easy anti-cheat anti solution in the market. It's available as part of Epic Online Services, again, for free. Um, this mostly applies to PC, right, because that's where 
the majority of that behavior happens. That's where people can just load up different applications. And that's really meant for detection from an algorithm that the easy anti-cheat determines and uh, figure out if there's malicious behavior from players of any kind. Um, if you look at the other side of the slide, we have uh, player reporting functionality as well. So there's a service for you to integrate into your game so you can have player-to-player -player reporting for any reasons that you may think are applicable for your game. So you determine what that behavior is and then you implement that into your game. This functionality is a little bit more custom, so it's, it is available for PC, console, and mobile. Um, and that allows you to send data to the back end and really look at those player reports and then take action. So for, from the take action perspective, in the middle there, there's sanctions. And those are really the things that are, are happening when any of these other two components are detecting player behavior, right? So if easy anti-cheat detects malicious behavior, you can set up to take automatic sanctions for that player and you can determine what that then is. Um, same on the player report side. Um, if their player report is sent, you can either just review it manually or have some uh, sanctioning system uh, attached to that. So the sanction system is also completely custom. You can determine what makes sense. So if a player gets reported, um, it, is that going to be a complete ban from the multiplayer functionality? Or maybe they were just being toxic in voice chat and you want to limit their, their voice chat because it's a first offense. So all that flexibility is there in the system for you to really determine what makes sense for your game. Um, so the combination of these three things, I'll let Sam kind of explain what they did in Midnight Ghost Hunt. Oop, go back. I bet. <laughs> so yeah, Midnight Ghost Hunt, it's a multiplayer versus game. So you're gonna need anti-cheat for that for sure. It doesn't really have a ranked, doesn't have a ranked mode, but it is a versus game. So we, when we started doing more of the larger beta tests, we started noticing a lot of cheaters show up. You know, people were distributing in an EXE that would give you wall hacks or instantly kill everyone on the map, that kind of fun stuff. And, you know, the Unreal architecture made it a larger attack target. Uh, and so, and typically anti-cheat is quite expensive, I've, I've noticed, especially for indies. It's quite kind of out of reach at times, but then Epic came and included easy anti-cheat, which is you know, a great anti-cheat included with Epic Online Services for free, we were uh, extremely excited about that because we were very worried that maybe we could launch without anti-cheat, which sounded uh, a bit crazy. Once we had it properly configured a couple weeks after uh, early access launch, cheating dropped off substantially. It, it didn't, but it's not gonna get rid of all of it. It's not gonna magically fix non-secure game design if you're not properly doing server authoritative logic. However, it did make it much more difficult for people to distribute an EXE that would totally ruin the game basically. So that was great. And also anyone who got caught in it would just get sanctioned, which is great. One last bit is that we do, uh, you can have a little custom branded splash screen that you can, you know, it's, it's the uh, easy anti-cheat splash screen, but you can customize it with your own cool screenshots. So it ends up being kind of like your splash screen for your game. So that's kind of a neat thing. And for sanctions, we also use that. We use the player reporting and sanction system. And the great thing, as mentioned, is it's all integrated automatically with Easy Anti-Cheat and all the other services. It's all in the convenient web portal in the back end. So you can search up specific players and see, oh, what kind of reports have they had? Has Anti-Cheat kicked them out of a game? All that kind of stuff happens in one place, which is amazing. And I guess I can't emphasize enough. It's like when we, early on, we had a couple different places where we did this because we were looking for free or, uh, I don't know, cheap solutions. And so we would have to go to multiple places to see, oh, who got reported, who got banned, that kind of thing. It's really great for our community team to be able just to go to one place and see when that stuff comes through. And that's great. A uh, quick little demo here of uh, me reporting a toxic player using our in-game interface. Got a report player. This person's being not so nice. So I type that out. Uh, we submit, which is great. And then uh, we transition here to our back end. It might be kind of hard to see, but you can go in here. There's the report that came in. The community team can look at that and decide to add a sanction, can do restrict the entire game access for a day, and can write a note for the rest of the community team like why this action was taken. And then you're done. Player is banned and maybe we'll learn a lesson. 
Cool. So um, hopefully that gave you all a good overview of what Epic Online Services is, what the cross-play kind of functionalities are within them, a little bit more detail on each one of those components, and then a really great example of like how that actually works in a game. I think that always makes it real to kind of see what that actually means inside of a game implementation. Um, so again, all these services are free. Feel free to check it out. There's a link on the website. Uh, make sure you check out Midnight Ghost Hunt. It's available on PC, so uh, download that as well. And Thank you for all for coming out here.